Hi guys. Hi. Hi. We're so happy to be here. <laughs> I we're really having like the best conversation today. <laughs> We've covered everything. Colts, Twilight, not the same. But I'm kind of the same. Listen. A lot. <laughs> My love for Twilight is a bit cultic, if I'm being honest. Yes, but I yeah. do. Yeah, we've had every conversation we could possibly have in the past 20 minutes we've had already. So I'm glad we're now pushing record. If I were to join a cult, it would be a Twilight cult. Yeah, I'm in. I want to name my kid Renesme. I was in the hospital like, have we once again bringing up the name Renesme? And my partner was you, like, shut the fuck up. I think you guys may already be in the Twilight Cult. I think you're there. Maybe it's us too. We can start it. We can just us. We can take all of the knowledge that we've learned. You as a therapist, me in the documentaries. Wow. And we could easily start one. Easily. I do think there's a power that therapists have that we could become great cult leaders if we yes. needed to. Right. Um, and it's why it's pretty important to have a good therapist and not a bad one because <laughs> they can cause a lot of harm. Yeah, that's true. I've yeah. never had a bad therapist. I'm so happy to hear that. Well, you. actually, no, there was one. Her name was okay. Sandra. And I was young. It was court. I have fact-checked this many times. Court-mandated therapist from my parents' divorce that, like, should have been a Lifetime movie. Like, it <laughs> has, like, kind of still going on. And it was, like, 10 years ago. But, I mean, it's not really. Love my family. They're great. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, she was not the best. And I didn't really like her. But to be fair, I didn't really like anyone at that time. Yeah. So, and court-mandated anything is going to be pretty much garbage, right? Like maybe, I feel like that makes sense. Yes, right? And also, you were probably at an age where you were not looking to process. Mm -hmm. You're mad. Yeah. You're still feeling your feelings. You're what we call a pre-contemplative stage. You're not actually ready to move forward. And so, Sandra... You didn't, you're not up to par, Sandra. Right. I hope you do better next time. And, you know, at a time in which everything's already out of your control, to have to go to someone who you don't know, you don't it's feel comfortable choice. with, and it's not your choice, it's like even more stuff that's out of your control. The only pro was that I got to skip school. Yeah. That's a huge pro. That was a good pro. And <laughs> I would be like, all right, I'm not going the entire day. Sorry. Like, I would be like, oh, it's too late. Or, like, I would be really slow on the way out. Like, oh, if I went back, it'd be an hour. You have to come back and get me anyway. Yes. I was a pro. I'm like, later in life, I did go to core for truancy. So <laughs> I had to get started there. It was fine. I, I was a student so who, like, did very well and was really involved. But, I, like, I was, like, class president. But that just means that you tell everyone else what to do and you don't really do anything. Mm. So I was like the most involved, least involved student. And I just like wouldn't go to school. I graduated early too. It's so like I really left. You're but a I complex think human. Then. Yeah, that's cool. You got a lot of layers I would like to see. A lot of layers. Very, a lot of layers. Very true. Because I've never heard class president and truancy court used in the same sentence yeah, before. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, you know. Congratulations on that. That's it's impressive. <laughs> Thank you. It is interesting. And you know what is also interesting? I'm tying this, not tie it back to me, but tying back yes, to yes, me. Yes, mm -hmm. I like people who surprise you in <gasps> general. I love, like, I love Casey Musgraves, who is like, <gasps> super liberal, super yes. country. I'm also Texan, like, die for country music. Yes. I love, I'm trying to think of a good example, but like, even like my like merch line was like breadwinning housewife and it's yeah. like stereotypically traditionally speaking that contradicts itself yes. right so maybe being a truant class president also kind of falls in that, that bubble wow unpredictable yeah really unpredictable wow. it's exciting you never know so, you, so you'd that. like, okay, so we're, I mean, we're here to talk about holidays and family um, complexities and stuff, but you, you got a little bit in that. You like a little chaos. You like a little dysfunction to you. Oh, yeah. I, I don't <laughs> love the chaos and the dysfunction in my family, though. Okay. That yeah. is what, that stresses me out. And I will say, before we get into this episode, I love my family. My family is great. And I'm talking about my issues, not yeah. their, like, it's not them. Yep. Um, I recently have been really big conversation has been like emotional regression mm -hmm. I have found I'm 25 and I I moved away when I was 17 so from 17 to 22 I was living in Los Angeles and I went to college out there I fully moved there and I moved out early right and the first thing I wanted to do I do come from a very emotionally explosive background and so the first thing I wanted to get under control was emotionally reacting to things when I moved yes. away and I felt like I got this down I moved back to Texas and I'm like oh my god like I almost felt like suffocated or claustrophobic. It wasn't even always like things that people were doing around me. It was that I was just regressing back to like my 12 year old self. Mm. And it sucks because like, yeah, you think you heal and stuff, but then you're on your family and it's like, all right, did you yeah. really, you know? So can we talk about that before we even get into uh, anything <laughs> yeah. else? Because that, I feel like that also plays a yeah. huge 
factor into the holidays. Yes. I think I'm, uh, first and foremost, just validating the fact that that's a thing is really important because I think it's so easy for us to be so hard on ourselves. And we're like, I have done all this work in therapy. I can go back to my family and I can have this holiday with them and I've got this, but it is so much harder to be in the same environment where all of that stuff started Yeah. and to be able to manage it while you're a- around everyone else's uh, struggles, right? There's so much that you don't have control over in your family dynamic. The only thing you have control over is how you process it and what you do with that. And so to be in the same environment where that started can be very challenging. You know, we've made a little bit of a joke about the word triggered, but the reality is is you get triggered, Yeah. Yeah. right? And like trigger is an actual, your nervous system saying to you, I'm going to explode. I'm going to shut down. I go and fight or flight. Right? Okay, right? So we sit here and we say, okay, I I have fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. So I'm going to people please you. I'm going to freeze and do absolutely nothing. I'm going to run away or I'm going to explode on your ass and really show you who's boss here, right? So we can keep this going. And the reality is, is that is what being triggered is. It isn't this huge joke. It's a really thing and it happens at the holidays it's one of our busiest times of year right we own a large we are we own a large therapy practice we're in many states and you should see the numbers when you (laughs) head into the holiday season it's wild because everyone's like i gotta go be around my aunt karen who always makes a comment about my weight i gotta go see my uncle chad who has something to say about my tattoos and like there's this thing that happens or i sit there where my parents are fighting or there's passive aggressiveness or all these different stuff that can genuinely make my body have a very very real visceral reaction it's crazy too because I'm now doing more therapy with like other members of my family to really get to the bottom of this because mm-hmm. I'm a very efficient person. Like <laughs> I want things done, you yeah. know, and I'm do- I'm very proactive when it comes to it. So it's like I have a lot of issues, but I don't want to like sit in them and I would like to fix them. I thought I fixed them already. Turns out, no, I didn't. It, not at all. <laughs> but I mean, not, you know, in other ways I have. But it's so interesting because I like hate the word triggered because it's just used for everything yes. and it like drives me insane. But I was sitting there talking to my therapist and I was like, I hate that I'm using this word, but I, it's just very triggering and it's things that are happening and it really doesn't even like there. No one's meaning to do anything. That's like, I don't think my family, I'm in a situation where I don't think my family is like coming after me mm-hmm. at this point, but it feels that way. And it's like my, my nervous system gets so out of whack and the only time that ever happens in my life is when it has something to do with family again not that it's their fault most of the time it's my fault like it's it's a a thing within me that I need to like heal and I have control of myself but it is very difficult also you mentioned something about family members talking about your weight one of the questions that kept getting asked Mm. was how do I get my family to stop talking about my weight or asking questions how do you deal with that Okay, so one of the things you want you to keep in mind is there are, the reality is you're right, most people have good intentions. Let's call that out right now, right? Like, for the most part, everyone is trying to be their best. And so somebody's saying like, oh, like you look beautiful, looks like you lost weight, or it looks like you've gained some weight. Like, people don't typically mean that as something horrible. Actually, generationally, that's a normal way to talk with people. Culturally, it's really normal to talk to people, but it's still harmful. So somebody may have a good intent, but it's a very bad impact. And so the ability to sit here, and the word we're going to use with this is called differentiation, the ability to respond and not react. Two very different stuff. A response is I'm going to address you. A reaction is I'm going to embody the triggering that I'm feeling, and I'm going to react to you, okay? So if someone makes this comment of, oh, wow, Jen, when I see you have that uh, that pumpkin pie on your plate, I always think about, you know, like, you do look like you've gained some weight for you to say, I'm actually not okay with you commenting on my body. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to eat this pumpkin pie. It does look very delicious. And please do not comment on my weight. What we do that is called something called a stroke and a kick. So yeah. something kind, I know it wasn't intentional, and still back off. That is really crazy to me that people, that happens in families. But yeah. that's All the, the time. We have, listen, so much drama in my family. The dynamics, are, again, should be a lifetime movie. <laughs> but I am grateful that that has never been mm-hmm. a thing. Yeah. It's huge. And I think that's one of the, you know, it comes up in so many ways, being able to set boundaries with your family and new boundaries with your family, right? Where in the past, if someone makes a comment on on your weight or what you're eating and your response was to turn inward and feel really shameful, then making that change to be able to say like, 
you know, I'm really excited to eat this pumpkin pie yet, uh, and I really don't appreciate you commenting on my body, is a really important but challenging thing to do. And it takes time. So I think that in the the way in which you can go about that too is prepping for some of those comments. If you know that they're gonna come, um, to be able to say, how am I gonna handle this when it happens? What will this look like for me well, going into it? And maybe that Ann Karen was someone you used to diet with. I love that her name's Ann Karen, I, I, by the It way. was just like the most. It and Uncle Chad, it's, it's like the best. Yeah. It's literally perfect. And so maybe it was that at one point you used to diet together with Ann Karen, but you've changed, right? Same thing for setting up boundaries. We talk about the idea of triangulation, right? Where we triangulate other people in to reduce our anxiety. Same think maybe I used to always talk smack on cousin Joe with um, Alexis next to me and then she comes to do it and I've decided you want to know what I'm not going to do this year I'm not going to be talking about people anymore and so but Alexis isn't used to that she's always comes up we talk smack together on cousin Joe so for me to say you know what I hear you I know it's tough and still I have decided this year I am not going to talk about anyone behind their back I'm going to address them directly to their face if I need to. So for you to reset this, Alexis is gonna feel weird because it's gonna bring up something for her, which is maybe I don't feel so good that I made this comment. And that's okay. Boundaries could upset other people and it doesn't mean we are wrong to set them. Mm -hmm. I wanna talk a little bit about triangulation. Okay. Oh yeah, fun. that's a big one. <laughs> Um, so with family, especially in the holidays, hmm. how, especially if you were the one I think if you were the one who's trying to get healthy and then you're going into a family that maybe isn't there yet or isn't doing that, it's difficult to set the boundaries and then you can feel like people are like ganging up on you. Mm, yeah. How do you deal with that? So I think one of the things that's really important, I think something that comes up a lot is if someone is talking smack about someone else, that um, to be able to say to them, hey, I think you should go directly to that person. Triangulation happens when there's anxiety within a relationship and they're taking the anxiety out of the relationship and putting it onto you, right? So when someone is ganging up on you, to be able to say like, hey, I recognize you're ganging up on me right now. What's going on for you? What's going on with, with you know, where's this coming from for you? What's happening for you? Putting it back on them. When we start getting defensive, we're almost taking it as, oh, you know, I have to defend myself. I've done something wrong. Really, it's something that's going on with them. So to be able to highlight that, like what's going on in your dynamic with them, I think it's really important that you talk to them about your anxiety or what's happening for you. Um, it's so common, especially in children of divorced families, that the children are triangulated into that relationship. Like, oh, your father did this and you need to go tell your father this. So I think that that, you know, is really common within divorced families and something that is important to be able to detriangulate yourself, which is your ability to say, hey, this is not my place. This is something that you need to talk to them about. Yeah. Uh, I mean, as a child of divorce, I mean, that's like huge. 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 Yeah. And what was the impact, right? Like you can sit mm -hmm. here and probably speak to yourself. Like, and, and once again, parents often do not have bad intentions. Definitely parents not. are doing yeah. the best they can. Yeah. If you think about it, like, I mean, our parents are, I mean, we're in our 30s and I have a child, but like, most people in their 30s now don't even have kids, yeah. right? Like you're child free. And, and there's this interesting part that you think, I think like, oh my God, like my kid, parents are raising adults in their 20s. Yeah. Like we don't know what the hell we're doing. Like we're all just trying our best here. So I do truly believe parents don't typically have malintentions. Of course, in, in abusive situations, that's not what we're talking about. But for the most part, people are trying their best. So when they did that, oh, go tell dad or your father did this. They weren't thinking, you know what? Long term, I'm going to give my child extreme anxiety, a bit right. of depression, some massive people pleasing, and a bit of an argumentative personality. <laughs> yeah. They're just like in the emotion, like reacting to something. Right. And they just don't have the skills. Yeah. Most of us don't have the skills yeah. because we don't actually yeah. teach relationship skills anywhere in life. Yeah, that is crazy. <laughs> I always think, too, like my parents got married in their 20s, started having kids in their 20s, they weren't in therapy growing up because why would they be? And it wasn't normal then. Yeah. So like I probably, who knows what I would have done. I don't, I always think that this is actually a new thought that I've had <laughs> to clarify. <laughs> so my parents are listening to this. Yeah, it's, it's a newer thought. And now I'm like kind of coming around like, oh, it makes more sense. It's yeah. very healing though. Yeah. As a child of divorce, because it, and I, it's interesting because I don't find that like, the divorce has affected me in the way of like, oh, I don't believe in marriage. I think it's just affected family dynamics and that's what's affected me. Mm -hmm. But it's healing to think about that because it's like they weren't, they really were probably doing the best that they could. And yeah. obviously they love me and their intentions weren't negative. It just, that's now, you know, there's aftermath. And like, I am the one who is paying my therapy bills. 
So that is like my one <laughs> thing. Yeah. You, know? you ever just like maybe just like slyly? Oh, I talk them about sending invoice? invoices a lot. Yeah, yeah. I, I, you could just try. Yeah, just like, do well, it. Well, I, maybe you handle this one. Oh, I thought about it. I actually <laughs> did. Now I am doing therapy with a family member, and I'm like, this one's on you. Like, I'm not <laughs> You're taking this. I'm like, there's no way. I'm like, she just raised her rates. Like, I got, I got a mortgage to pay. Uh, you know. <laughs> I'm like, there's just no way, no way at all. Okay, so there's a lot of questions. Okay, we're ready. Um, this is all very helpful. I'm like, for me as well. Okay. okay, how, we already talked a little bit about setting boundaries, but I feel like a lot of us have already set boundaries. So yes. someone asked, how do I set firm boundaries with my mom instead of giving in on the ones I've already tried to set? Okay, so you've, she's done a tremendous job. First of all, Bravo. Amazing. We love you. We love your boundaries. We love how bad you are. <laughs> we love boundaries. Do this, right? Okay. What's the reason that they aren't being used, right? So, like, is it that mom continuously guilt trips you? Is it mom that basically says, like, I don't give a crap about your boundary. I'm going to bulldoze through this. What keeps happening? Because boundary isn't about how someone else is going to react. We don't get to control that part. I set a boundary and I hope that mom is like, oh yeah, I really hear you. I'll never make a comment about your weight again. It's rarely going to happen. Boundaries are for us, for us to speak up for ourselves. So it might be that the boundary has to continuously get more firm. Mom, if you do do this, I can't come home for the holidays. Mom, if you do this, I'm only going to be able to stay for two hours at Thanksgiving. You know, any of these things. But also, sometimes it's not about words at a certain point. Sometimes it's about, I'm going to have to think about what's really harmful to me, and I'm going to have to remove myself from that. I think also a common misconception about boundaries is that you just have to set them once, <laughs> right? And so, you know, when we're trying to change a dynamic in a relationship, a relationship that has been going on for years and years and years, and the same dynamic is happening, it takes time to set a boundary, right? It might be that you're continuously setting this boundary over and over and over again. The tough thing, which it sounds like this listener might be struggling with, is that it's really vulnerable and can be really painful to set a boundary and do something different in a relationship and have it not be respected. And sometimes when it's not respected, we go into this really like painful place of, well, I'm just gonna shut down. There's no reason to even do this. And so I think that being able to prep yourself for this, know that you have to continually set a boundary and maybe they have to get firmer over time. Um, and it has to turn into action at some point if you know verbal boundaries aren't working. Um, that just to be aware of that, that it doesn't just change overnight or with one boundary set. Boundary work is also grief work because there's a ton of grieving and people yeah. not respecting our boundaries and realizing, oh my gosh, here's where my mom's limited. And you wanna know what, I wish it wasn't like that. I'm actually really sad that I can't have this relationship I want with my mom. Maybe I was like, I really love Lorelai and Rory and I just want this Gilmore girl's <laughs> life and I'm not getting it. Hey, even if it's fantasy or not, grief is completely reasonable and acceptable to go through and to feel that. So she did a tremendous job of setting the boundaries. What do you also need to do to take care of yourself next? Is it remove yourself because there's actual harm? Or is it, you want to know what? I have to actually give this up and let this go and grieve what I'm not going to have and move forward. I think that's sometimes the hardest part to be able to say the relationship isn't what I expected it to be or wanted it to be. Yeah. And to get to that point, you sometimes have to go through these pain points of like, I am trying to do my part. I'm setting, I am have control over what I have control over in terms of setting these boundaries and being communicative about them. But I don't have control over whether my parent changes. And if they don't change, maybe I do have to grieve that relationship that I expected it to be. And sometimes that can be really, really challenging. I read this book, I think, Stop Walking at Eggshells. Yep. Yes. Um, great book. Great book. My therapist recommended it to me <laughs> week one. <laughs> I, I love therapy. Um, and that book helped me so much. It, yeah. I, it does talk about like more specific like disorders yes. and stuff, yeah. but I think it would be helpful to anyone, even if you're not dealing with that. Yes. It was like literally the most helpful book I've ever read. I recommend that book to someone weekly. I have <laughs> bought it for multiple people and had it like delivered like <laughs> Amazon Prime to your house. <laughs> I'm like, there you go. Because it's so, it's so, it so good. Yeah. It's like an so amazing helpful. read. Yes. Yep. An amazing read. Okay. <laughs> how, okay, actually, how to make your parents see you as an adult and not theirs. So I think that also goes to like how to deal with controlling parents. Yeah. And once again, we always get questions on our podcast too of like, how do I make 
people do this, right? And so that is the thing because of course, it is, yeah. it's, and it's so hard because we want so badly for things to change. Um, but when we focus on how do I make someone else do X, we feel even more out of control, right? It's even more painful for us when the person doesn't change. Um, so how do I make them see me as an adult? I think that that in and of itself um, is going to be challenging. I think for you to be able to see yourself as an adult when in their presence, is the most important thing. So I would ask this person, what is it when you are in your, when you're with your parents, what is it that's making you feel like a child? Like, what is it that's going on for you? What's the experiences you're having with them? And what is it that you can take control of in those experiences? And it's not going to be your parents' response to it. It's how can I, maybe I have to manage my own reactivity in their presence, right? What does that look like? Maybe the tools that were once working for me when I'm not with them that allows me to feel more differentiated, um, don't work when I'm with them. Maybe I have to have more physical separation when I'm home. Um, so you might have to develop different kinds of tools when you are with your parents as opposed to when you're separate from them because of that regression that's coming up for you. I think it's really significant, this part they said about, um, like, almost feels like they're I'm an extension of them or something, mm -hmm. right? Like, and what we talk about is boundaries. Boundaries are reciprocal. So if we have parents that are overly engaged, or the word we use as family therapists is enmeshed, um, it often means there's disengagement with somewhere else. Maybe they have another sibling that they're cut off from. Maybe they're disengaged from their family of origins. Maybe their marriage has some conflict in it. And so they overly put everything on to me. Those boundaries are reciprocal. If I'm feeling like that is how they see me, I have to create some very different boundaries. She, this person's also, I'm sorry, I assumed it was a woman, but this person's also um, saying they, they're treating me like a child and I, and I want to be seen this way. You're allowed to use your voice and say those very real words. I feel like you infantilized me a bit. I feel like I'm childlike to you and, and I'm this age and these are the things I do and here's what comes up for me when you do that. What would it be like to be honest with them about the impact of what they're doing? And they might laugh in your face and give you nothing. We don't get to control the other person, but you stood up for yourself and was that significant and important for you to do? It's like the smothering parent. That's what I think of. So what yeah, we call it, yeah, helicopter, so, helicopter, right? So we call it a mesh, and usually it's coming because there is disengagement, mm -hmm. and there is cut off somewhere else, and so they mesh into someone else. Very common. With Very common. And, children. and you know, there's this level of like this multi generational transmission process that happens. That um, you know, it's very possible that their parents were the same way with them, right? And so, for you to be able to make a different decision in your family that's different than maybe what your parents did is such a brave decision to make. To be able to say, I'm going to change the patterns, and the way in which I'm going to change these patterns is I'm going to speak up. I'm going to set more boundaries with you, um, because for them. It might be like, oh, you know, this is this is what a parent-child relationship is, and it lasts for. It doesn't matter if you're an adult, but this is this is what it is, and this is how long it lasts for. It lasts for your whole life. I'm going to treat you like a child. So. Um, once again, we talk a lot about how there's no malintention behind it, but really it's it might be what they know from their upbringing as well. Yeah, yeah I, I'm thinking of like so many different relationships. <laughs> I'm like, this adds up, uh -huh. this adds up. I'm like terrified of being a kid because I'm like in the position, or of being a parent, because right now I'm in the position of obviously the child, right. you know? Yeah. And then as time goes on, I'm like, oh. Therapy, you know? I will say the interesting thing about becoming a parent that we talk with so many parents about is like it does give you a little bit more empathy for your parents. You're like, this is so much harder than I thought. I was so mad at you for screwing it up so much. And then inevitably we all screw up our kids and that's yeah. like the importance of learning <laughs> to apologize and learning to take ownership. And so like right to sit here and say like, oh, I, I'm totally going to screw this kid up yeah. because like that's just kind of what we do, unfortunately. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That makes me feel like harder, <laughs> harder life. Okay, hot topic right now, especially yes. in the recent years. <laughs> well, interesting. They go, my in-laws are boring. This is a side note. Huh? And have extreme political views. How do I survive Christmas with them? Okay. You, you're going to take this one? <laughs> this is my life. Um, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. that's, why, that's literally why I was staring at her. I'll let so, you take this. Here's what I would say. There is boring and there's frustrating and then there's harmful. We don't get to choose our in-laws. We marry someone and they come with a family. So... They come along, right? But I am allowed to say I have to take breaks from these interactions. I can't stay in the same house as them. I have to have a hotel room. I can't stay for multiple days. And is there enough peace and space to say we're not going to talk about politics? You're right. The, we get this. I mean, 
we sit, how often do we get this question? All the time. This is, I mean, people, anytime we talk about family dynamics, we get this question. About politics, right? People are paying hundreds of dollars a month to sit in therapy to figure out how to deal over politics that have divided us so much, right? Mm -hmm. So one, is there space to be able to say, we actually all disagree on this. There's not going to be any type of productive conversation or actually we're not even able to have a safe conversation. So can it be that we're together for three days, we do not talk about politics? And if somebody can't respect that basic boundary, they're also saying, I don't really care if you stay. And so you're going to have to decide for yourself, is that worth it? And so there's harm and there's frustration. Sometimes your in-laws are boring. Nah, so whatever. You have a few shots to kill. I would say boring is probably the best. That's the best one, right? You That's have a few shots to kill. You play a board game and you figure out something to work for that evening. If there's harm then that's very different. We have to figure out how we truly take care of ourselves. If, I, if you're a marginalized or oppressed person and you're with someone who has extremely conservative, hurtful views, then you're gonna wanna like- that's what I was gonna bring up. Yeah. Then you're gonna wanna have a harder boundary. What keeps me safe? So there's frustrating and then there's harm. And we do different things of how to handle both of those. So if you are in a marginalized group and let's say you have to just not be around them and you have to do the holidays on your own, mm -hmm. What are some like affirming words for those people or like dealing with loneliness in the holiday season, which is also a topic I wanted to talk about. Yes. Anyways. So a few things that I would say is the ability to sit here and say, my job is to keep me safe. And that is this decision I am making. And with safety also comes grief and discomfort. We don't ever get to one emotion without a whole bunch of other ones, right? So I can feel all these, I can sit through this discomfort and sit here and truly in my, like in my core of a human, my sacred ground that I sit and know this was the right thing for me, right? Trust in self. Trust in self is not built from high self-esteem and looking good on Instagram. Trust in self is built from mastery. Mastery is also built from showing up for ourselves. I don't let people talk down to me. I don't sit in areas where people disrespect for me. At least not ones where I don't stand up. Whatever. If I can have I can have tough conversation, right? Do I believe that we can have hard conversations? Absolutely. Do I believe that anyone needs to put themselves in harm's way? Heck no. And how do I decipher between those things? So those words I would say, look in a mirror and say to yourself, I kept myself safe. That's the most beautiful thing I could do for myself. That is true self-love to check in with safety first. And where's the chosen family I need now? Because when we talk about loneliness in the holidays, it often comes from a preconceived notion about what I think the holidays should look like. And many of us don't have families that look like that. Mm -hmm. I think there's a ton of expectations around the holidays around family um, that can really get in the way of that too, yeah. right? We have these expectations of, um, you know, e even with in-laws, I'm gonna get married and I'm gonna be so close to my in-laws and we're gonna have this one big happy family, <laughs> right? Especially if you grew up in a family where maybe you're not as close um, with your family. And so I think expectations around your in-laws, expectations around the holidays can be part of the reason why that can be really challenging for us. There is a reason in our practice, we have so many people reach out to us around the holidays because the holidays can be really, really tough for people because of expectations, right? Oh, this is supposed to be the most joyous, you know, holiday of the year. And it usually isn't for a lot of people. For some it is, but for a lot, it can be really lonely. Um, and it can be a time of grief, right? If you lost someone that year, if you lost someone a few years ago, that it can be a time where you're like, you know, you're missing the person who used to be at your holidays, whether you lost them through passing away or another, some sort of cut off. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that our expectations around the holidays that have been built up from so many different things are another huge reason why we really struggle around the holidays because we are grieving that idea of this is what it's supposed to look like and it doesn't look like that. So just being able to validate the fact that it doesn't look like that for most people, it doesn't <laughs> look like that for a lot of people is really important. I like literally think I am Mrs. Claus. I love the holiday season. I live for it year round. November 1st, <laughs> my tree is up. I love Christmas and I have a huge family, yeah. right? But every year I get really lonely. It does make me sad and it's really difficult to deal with. There's always some sort of really bad family drama. Like none of us have the families dynamic that I think we wish for and hope for because I think that they don't really exist don't. either because it's just full of people. Mm -hmm. um, but even with someone who like, I'm posting constantly that I love Christmas, like I, because I do, mm -hmm. 
And I do a lot of these things by myself and also with my friends. But I definitely struggle in the holiday season. I feel like most people do. But I do love it at the same time. Well, I love that you're sitting here and able to say both. I can love something and it can be challenging. It doesn't mean you don't love the holidays. It doesn't mean that you aren't Mrs. Claus because I think that you are. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) But also, (laughs) it also means if I feel all of these things, I also feel all of these things. I live on both of these ends of the spectrum because we are all complex people, right? You said you like those surprises, Mm -hmm. Mrs. Claus. There it is, the conflicts. And, but we do have this idea. A lot of this is expectations. A lot of it is I have an up, 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 up around the holidays and then a down, 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 down because shit doesn't go. Somebody ends up sick. I mean, the past few years with COVID, right? Yeah. Somebody ends up having COVID. They don't come. Man, that's really stunk all those years, right? Like there's a lot of grief that has come with all of this and it's very common around the holidays. It's not by chance that self-harm increases around the holiday season. Yeah. Yeah. And I think when we dismiss kind of the loneliness, the more challenging feelings, we don't allow ourselves to embrace that at the same time as embracing the other things. Those challenging feelings get heavier and they get harder to manage because we're like, I'm not supposed to feel this way. I'm going to push this down. I am going to pretend like this isn't happening. We shove them down. We don't allow ourselves to feel them when they come up because we have shame around it. I'm not supposed to feel lonely. I'm not supposed to struggle. But it is as we're saying, very natural to have those feelings, have challenging feelings and have, you know, feelings that feel really good around the holidays. So allowing yourself to feel both. And when you are struggling, you know, when you're struggling with the more challenging ones to have things in place where you can say, this is how I'm going to take care of myself when I am feeling lonely, when I am feeling sad, to give that to yourself too. Speaking of expectations, I always say this about New Year's Eve and 4th of July. They end up being a bust unless you have some great, great tradition and like plans for the boat or whatever. But there's so much expectation on both of those days. And then when I don't have the plans that I want or everyone's somewhere and I'm not invited or whatever it is, it I, I hate it. I literally went on a family trip for 4th of July. I was like, I'm going, I don't want to be in town. Cause like, it's not gonna, I'm actually going to Paris um, this New Year's Eve. But okay, for the that's night, amazing. So Sounds that I, I'm feeling will be like a good New Year's yeah. Eve. Like I don't want to like, I don't want to <laughs> jinx that. Um, but normally my New Year's Eve's are like really, yeah, the end of the bus. Yeah. Well, I think that part of it, right, this is so much about what's the story I tell myself. Mm-hmm. The story I tell myself is that New Year's Eve is the best party ever and 4th of July is the best party ever. And sometimes mm-hmm. a random Saturday in February is the best party ever. So yes. We have these stories that we tell ourselves. Maybe that story is that my family will never get along. Maybe that story is that these holidays are the best or the worst. Maybe it's blah, 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 right? If I tell myself a story, am I actually giving my chance a self to be present and see what actually happens? If I deconstruct the story around it, if I rewrite the narrative, if I relook at these chapters, then I can make it into what I want it to be. But I love the idea of just taking control. I'm going away for it. This is always a bust. I feel like crap every time. So you want to know what? I'm actually going to wake up and maybe I I don't have the means to go away, but maybe I wake up and I'm like, you know what I want is I want to go to the movies by myself and I want to eat all this crap by myself and I want to do this. I want to have fun and I'm going to stay off of social media. Because if you're feeling that way, what does not help is feeling more like crap. Yeah. Yeah. So if I'm going to set myself up, not for perfection, but if I'm going to set myself up for a little bit more success, how do I genuinely do that in a protective manner? And it often means when I have expectations, i got to stay off social media and see what other people are doing because they're posting their highlight reels too. And when you're not invited to that party and that party probably sucked, it still looked like the coolest party ever on Instagram. Always. And New Year's is always miserable. Miserable. Right? It's yeah, like always. everything's so expensive. You leave your house and you're like, and you're like, well, it's charge a hundred dollars. And it's <laughs> freezing. I mean, at yeah. least where we live, yeah. it yeah, is freezing. Yeah, I guess not where, yeah. yeah. But you're right. It's, it's, and it's crowded. The parties are not fun. No, it's horrible. It's very expensive. My ideal New Year's Eve would be like in a cabin with friends, you know, and, and that's that so control. Take control well, that was what we were going to do. And then people were not giving me my answers so I was like bye I'm going to Paris that's Amazing. actually like what happened well they weren't knocking me we went on like so many trips this year so yeah, like, yeah. friends I love you it's not your fault <laughs> um, but I am going to Paris so Amazing. I think it'll be good but I say that and just so everyone knows my I'm normally not in Paris on New Year's Eve this is like a new thing for me yeah, yeah. it's not always the most fun um oh how to deal with rude in law. So we did talk about the political views and yes. some issues there. Rude in laws, I'm assuming it's boundaries. The answer to everything we're coming back to is boundaries, yes. guys. It is. But the other thing that we're talking about when it's in laws, the number one thing is you have to be on the same page as your partner. Because if your in laws say something hurtful, harmful, rude, triggering, whatever it is, 
what you're really looking for is to feel like your partner's on your team. So this goes into a little bit of couples and relationship work of like, you know what, if that's just who they are, like sometimes I'm just around rude people. Right, you've ever been around just yes. like a rude person, like you can't really control them. And same thing with your in-laws, whatever, you can set boundaries. But what you need is for your partner to take you in the next room and be like, I heard it, it was totally rude, it wasn't cool, I love you and I'm so glad you're here with me. Because I feel like someone has my back, that it doesn't feel like us against them. Right. Mm -hmm. It feels like, OK, this is in the greater good, because if it's me against you as my spouse, as opposed to this is the thing to do for our marriage, because it's important for you that we're here. Our kids like seeing their grandparents, the dogs happy to run around the backyard and leave the city. Right. Like any of those things you tell yourself, like that's truly putting us first. And then you don't feel so darn resentful. I think that that's to make sure it doesn't bleed into your relationship yeah. is very, very important because what happens at times is that your partner is so used to their parents' comments, right? They're immune to basically what their parents are saying. So you get in a situation and they're saying something rude and it's so much, it affects you so much more than it would ever affect your partner because they're so used to it. So to be able to have a conversation with your partner say like, hey, this really upset me. This really hurt me. Um, next time when this happens, what can we do when they say something, what feels, you know, this is what would feel safe for me. How can we approach this together? Um, the conflict arises at times when partners have trouble validating that that was our experience because they're so immune to it, right? Or they're like, that's my family. I'm going to defend my family. That sometimes the going, going from the transition of uh, your nuclear family to building a new family can be really hard and can take time. And so that's part of the process, just to be able to say, no, we're building a family together now. That's the most important thing. We need to boundary our relationship and we need to boundary our relationship when we are at home with your parents. Speaking of couples, yes. yep. how should you navigate splitting the holidays, especially if both of your parents are divorced? I think about this, by the way, I'm not even dating. So like, yeah. I'm really ahead of myself, but it's really annoying that my parents are divorced because chances are their parents will be divorced. And then what am I going to do with the holidays? Before four events, like, four events. that is crazy. And Unless if they you marry a Jew, Jew. Yes. That's a really good, oh, very yeah, smart. Yeah, so if I'm you're a smart, Jew, it's really yes, easy. Marry someone of a different religion. Yeah. Right? And <laughs> then, siblings are Jewish. Okay. So that was going to work out for them. Yeah. That, that's really well for them. Right. You're right. Okay. Four holidays. Whoa. A <laughs> lot of different events. All right. So one of it's going to depend. Where does everyone live? it's almost harder if everyone lives in the same radius because yeah. then you're expected to attend everything. And so what you're going to have to do is start having hard conversations or you're going to say to everyone, actually, we're going to host and you guys can all come and you'll have to figure out and deal with your conflict. That's actually my plan. That's a That's great, plan. great plan. Got to get if, really rich, but yeah. Yes, right. You yeah. can do it. Yeah. Um, I believe in you. You're good. Um, right? <laughs> if you, but if you live farther away, then you can say like, okay, so this year we do Thanksgiving with them, Christmas with you, um, right Easter over there, whatever you want these things to do, you have to split it up. But the main part is we, you and I, me and partner are on the same page about how this is. Not we're fighting about it every second. I cannot tell you, we have couples, I mean, we were couples, we work with families, we're systemic therapists. This comes up every holiday season. And it's one of the biggest things that comes up in premarital counseling when mm -hmm. we do it too. I'm so worried about the holidays. I don't want to give up my tradition part of relationships is compromise. And so you might have to give up a little bit of yours and that sucks. Grieve it, feel it, be okay with it and say, but what's best for us as a relationship? And trying to make everyone happy is gonna probably end up with you very unhappy. I think that's the, that's the piece that we don't allow ourselves to talk about enough when we are getting married, right? We're focusing on- The wedding. The wedding, and right? It's more about the wedding, it's more about, but there are a lot of, there's also a lot of things you give up when you get married. I know that sounds very, you know- Pessimistic. Pessimistic, yeah. but also realistic. Um, because you, your traditions do change, right? You're creating a new, you're creating new traditions um, in your family. And so I think too, being able to say, how are we gonna communicate about the holidays together as a couple, and then how are we going to communicate that with our families, right? That I think the trouble that some couples run into is that they allow their families to dictate their schedule as opposed to them being able to dictate it, to say, this is what works for us and our family. I am go, you know, we're coming here on Saturday. We're coming, I don't know how Christmas works, but we're going <laughs> to, <laughs> but, um, but to Christmas be able to Eve, Christmas day, right, right. Yeah. The whole thing. Yeah. Um, or, or right. We say, okay, this is our plan that for Thanksgiving, we're going to go to your 
your family's house. And for Christmas, we're going to go to my family's house, especially, right? So there's a bunch of holidays right there that you can split them up. You just have to be proactive about it. Yeah. I thought was my next question was at what point, if you're being proactive about it, should you have that conversation? Like in the year, let's say you didn't do it in premarital counseling and it's coming up and it's your first time. Like when should you bring it up? Okay. Keep this in mind. All contracts, all relationships are contracts. We have rules, right? So we have conscious contracts and unconscious contracts. An unconscious contract is when we get married, he's never going to want to go to his mom's house. My parents' Christmas is so much better. So, <laughs> I, so you know what? It's just going to happen. That's actually an agreement you put the person in without them signing, and that's not exactly fair. So we have conscious and unconscious contracts. The coolest thing about contracts is that they are living, breathing, real things that change throughout time. You can say, we're going to try it this way this year, and then we're going to navigate afterwards. What we don't want you to do is to wait until the week before you have an unconscious idea, or you have a conscious idea here saying, if I just don't bring it up, he's going to be fine with just going to all my family events, and it's not going to be a problem. <laughs> That's not true, because guess what? They're thinking the same exact thing about you, and then we have a large conflict. So what I would recommend is to say, we're going to try it all these different ways. But also then maybe we end up moving to Paris. Hey, and then that's it. I think that's the answer to everything. Just move to yeah. go, just move go to Paris. Paris, right? Go to Paris. <laughs> so it's so having conversations earlier, right? But also allowing there be tons of flexibility and adaptation if something works and something doesn't work. Because it might be like, oh my gosh, I actually really like what they do for New Year's Eve, but I like opening presents with mine on New Year's Day, and here's what we figure it out, right? Like what are all these things we want to do. So living, breathing, adaptable, compromise. Feel the loss that comes with all of those and put the relationship first. When you guys talk about feeling the loss, obviously in so many different categories, how, what are like tangible ways that you can do that to where it's not lasting too long? You know, I think some of the reasons why it lasts really long is that we don't allow ourselves to feel it, right? We push it down and say, I shouldn't feel this way. So I know it's really cliche coming from therapists <laughs> to say, you need to just feel it and acknowledge it and say, it's okay to be feeling this. Um, I think we hold on to things so strongly because we, we want them to be true. And, but when we hold on to those things, right? Like, oh, you know, I know that my mom's going to change if I just like keep doing this and they don't change when we hold on to that, we are holding on to a false reality and that can be even more painful and can keep us from really moving forward as pain. Grief is very painful. It doesn't feel like there's much we can do with it. We feel like, oh, if I sit in this grief, I'm doing something wrong. There's something wrong. I'm never going to get out of this. We hear that all the time. If I allow myself to feel this, when will I be able to get out of it? Right? There's like, I want to fix the feeling. We get that question all the time. I don't want to feel this. How do I not feel this? But sometimes allowing yourself to dive into it, to really feel it and say, listen, this is really upsetting. Cry about it. Let yourself feel it. Talk to your partner about it. I'm really upset about this. I'm acknowledging that this, that I can't have the same traditions that I once had, right? This is really, really hard for me. The acknowledgement and the ability to validate yourself in that is a way in which you can move through it. What, what happens is that we deny ourselves the ability to feel that. And when we deny ourselves the ability, it lasts way longer. You know, Kenzie, you talked about you're a very productive, efficient gal. I was thinking this, this is hard for you. Yes. Oh, very. Because I was thinking you an answer, thing. right? So we're really screwing you right now. Because no, what you you're want, like, crap. Yeah. Right? But like, it's a good <laughs> thing. So if you want it to be a little bit more efficient, I'm going to give you a little bit of a hint here. One of those is if I'm going to say, I'm going to go to someone, and I'm going to say, I have to talk about how sad I'm feeling. Don't solve it. Just hear me. I want you to say nothing besides this sucks so bad. Because then that actually gives space. Because if somebody starts giving you solutions, then you lose it. It's gone. And there's a difference between feeling an emotion and being an emotion. I can feel sadness, but if I am sadness, I embody it. I'm not getting out of bed. I'm not washing my hair. I'm back to Gilmore Girls all over again, right? I have to reread all my Twilights, all the things <laughs> that I'm feeling, right? And so to sit here and say, okay, one, I'm going to talk it out. Or maybe that doesn't feel safe for me. I'm going to write it out. The power of writing is Huge very writer. important, right? Okay, same thing with an internal internal um, uh, monologue with myself. Say to myself, oh my God, I hurt. And maybe I'm someone who intellectualizes stuff and I'm very efficient and productive. We're not talking about anyone in this room. Um, and so what you might want to do in a situation like that is to say, where do I feel it in my body? My chest feels tight. My hands feel sweaty. I feel a pain in my head all of a sudden. For some of us, we can actually f like 
to find it in our body before we can actually feel it and then say, you know what, every time something crappy happens, I notice my stomach actually feels a bit queasy. I'm wondering if my body's telling me something. And so then to sit there and say, okay, this is when I'm going to write it out and I'm going to put on sad music and I'm going to light a candle and I'm, I'm going to, you know, feel sadness. And then I'm going to say to myself, now I'm going to go to my day. And if I need to revisit this sadness, I can. Or if I need to check in on it tomorrow, I can. Or if I need to say hello next week, that's fine too. But I don't have to take it with me all the time. Because when we talk about grief, we're all talking about ocean waves. They come and go. They might smack me on my ass, though, if I'm not looking. <laughs> yeah. They might knock me right down. Or I can ride in through the wave and come out the other side. What's really interesting about me is that I, well, there's, there's two ends to this. So there's one end where I avoid any emotion or feeling because it'll then set me back on my work mm. and like my life just in one like area. So the only area of my life that I'm not like that in though would be breakups because for some reason I'm like logically in order to get over this, I need to feel it. So, and I think naturally that's what they say. Like women typically lean towards anyways, but I'm like, I'm giving myself time to be sad immediately so that then I'm able to heal from it. But in other areas of my life, exactly, I'm like, I, there are, uh, even like moving back to Texas, I'm like, there's so many things in the past two years. I had two deaths in my family very close to me, one in my immediate family, and I didn't deal with it. Like for, it was, it was like 2018, 2019, mm -hmm. when I moved back, like yeah. I, it was so weird. I like couldn't, cause I thought like, oh, if I deal with it and then I'm gonna be sad forever. And I, I just like couldn't get myself to do it. Mm -hmm. And then I was like one of the like pandemic, like realizations of things. I'm like, well, I have nothing else to do. You know, I guess it's yeah. time to deal with this. <laughs> well, but it's like, I don't want to do that anymore. But I definitely do that in every area of my life besides breakups. But you just told us the fear. The fear is that if I let it out, it'll never be contained again. Right. So we already know yeah. what the fear is. But, True. And you've, and you've also already proven that you can contain it if you allow yourself to feel it. That you have True. the ability to nurture yourself through it if you allow yourself to feel it. So we, we discount a lot of the times in our lives when we are doing the things that we fear the most. Because we say, oh, I can't, I can't deal with emotion. I am a fixed. I never do this, but you've actually proven that you can nurture yourself through really painful emotions and that you've done it multiple times. And that's the thing, we, we end up discounting something when we have actually allowed ourselves to move through it. So something you can say to yourself when you're saying, I wanna, you know, I wanna feel this feeling, I know it's here, but I'm scared to allow, allow myself to feel it. I, I don't know if I'll be able to contain it, is to be able to say, I think so quickly we jump to, I want to get over this, right? I just want to get over yep, this. I don't want to feel this. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> and so, so something you can try is to say, how do I nurture myself through this feeling? How do I allow myself to feel it? And then how am I going to nurture myself through it? And then at what point am I going to put it back and say, okay, I have to do something else, right? It sounds to me like you have allowed yourself to feel emotions and have been able to move through it and to move on and do something else. You're functioning very well. Thanks, guys. I love the You're therapist. Welcome. I know. It's okay. But I guess it sounds like you have to rewrite your story now. Yeah. Some of the stuff you're telling yourself is based on past you, not current you. And so you're going to need yeah. to rewrite some of those scripts you're saying to yourself in your head. In this session that we've had today. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, I've realized that. And then also I'm like, there are certain things where I'm like, oh, my family will never get along. Or like this one. You know what I mean? I'm like, I have to like rewrite those. Yeah. Because, I mean, if I, that's my narrative. Also, I do think, like, you're going to find what you're looking for, too. Yeah. So if I'm going in with that lens, like, that's what I'm going to see. Yep. You know? Yes. Yeah. Guys, this has been an incredible episode. You guys can go back on the show, like, literally <laughs> whenever you want. <laughs> Oh Deal. my God, I'm well, like gonna be your number one listener. That's so nice. Yeah, I really will be. I'm like, hey girls, what are you talking about? <laughs> Thanks for having us Thank on. Thank you so much. Where you guys are being so you? vulnerable. Oh, wait, you oh, did. Of course. I know, but that's hard to do, especially around therapists. We're not always trustworthy. People are like, they're gonna read our thoughts or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, people are really like, scared. I, <laughs> I'm like a little too open sometimes, I think, you know? I love no people such thing who are that open. for us. Um, <laughs> but you can find us, um, you can listen to us on Shrink Chicks uh, podcast. I'm Emily Beerley, I'm licensed marriage and family therapist, and Jennifer Chaikin, mm -hmm. licensed marriage marriage family therapist you can also if you're interested in finding a great therapist because you have had some negative experiences we would love to help you out we have um, um, 45 amazing clinicians throughout the united states specifically in um, massachusetts new york new jersey delaware pennsylvania florida and california we're working on texas okay. um and if you're interested if you live in any of those states and you're looking for a therapist um you can check out the therapygroup.com we'd love to connect you with someone badass and awesome to work on yourself 
amazing thanks guys thank you all right guys i hope you enjoyed if you did let me know by giving it a nice thumbs up and subscribe for more